This the, uh, conference Grand will now be recorded. We snow day, and we actually made it on the CFTR. They announced it on CFTR because everybody listened to that. Yeah. yeah. We that was here. a pretty popular station in the day. Yep. Okay. Well, seven o'clock, so let's get at it. Uh, I'll call the meeting to order. Uh, I see that we have all of council here, and my computer has a mind of its own with things popping up. Uh, Lindsay, do you have a list for uh, open forum? Uh, yes, Mayor Woodbury, I do. I have um, Tom Arnett, Heather Arnett, and Robert Creaney. Okay. So I guess if we go in order of when they signed up, it would be uh, Tom Arnett and Heather Arnett first, and then yeah. uh, Robert. Okay. So, Tom, if you'd like to go ahead, um, this is open forum and we only do about three minutes uh, a person on it. So, uh, if you'd like to go ahead as soon as you're ready and uh, welcome. I don't have the camera. Okay. You want that? Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, good evening, Mayor Woodbury, councillors, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak. I have four points that I want to cover. Uh, the first is regarding the Burnside report and would like to know what the reason was for the two month delay in this report being available for public review and can we now count on a two month delay in submitting the staff report to the county. Um, this report has been available for the, to the public for only 48 hours plus which has really not been enough time to review it thoroughly. And Camp Creek seems to have taken a, an added importance in this report compared to some of the other ones. And regardless of, of that, I have contacted Trout Unlimited Canada, which is a nonprofit conservation group whose mission is to conserve, protect, restore Canada's freshwater ecosystems and cold water resources. They requested a copy of the SAR and Burnside reports and said they would give some contacts to me. Um, I also want to con or, uh, comment on point 61 of that Burnside report, and it's about dark sky lighting. Um, this issue is huge. Um, it's very important in the environmental impact study, the visual impact study. Um, yet I seem to think we have a developer that seems to be picking and choosing which points are important, and I'll use the lighting on the dock and the clubhouse as an example. Um, it's excessive. It's on every night, all night, even when the resort is closed due to the pandemic. And is this picking and choosing, you know, important issues like this going to be a precedent that we're gonna see? I mean, it's just a question that I have. Point number two I wanna make is regarding the provincial policy statement, the Great County Artificial Plan. I made reference in my email to Appendix B in my public comments of March of 2020. Uh, there are many questions and concerns that are directly related to those two planning pieces, but none more important than the lake capacity study, and my wife Heather is going to uh, comment on that a little bit later. The third point is the Southgate official plan, and specifically section 452. Uh, there are some planning issues in and around the dock that should have been in the application, and they never were. Fourth is the golden brown algae issue. You know, this, these are awful floating mats. They appear in the uh, lake every summer, yet there hasn't been one mention of this in any of these studies. It was mentioned in the staff report, but not the studies. Correspondence by me with Professor Jan Stevenson of Michigan State first identified this problem long before anybody else in Ontario. Now, Stevenson has done extensive research, you know, on this type of algae. Now the developer suggested a visit for consultation and asked me for his email and I'm just curious to know whether that was ever followed up because I haven't heard anything. So it, kind of in a nutshell, um, there are so many unutilized resources and questions that the um, township hasn't answered. And the effect of this development on Wilder Lake goes far beyond the flowing of the water from west to north. And we've heard this a million times that that's the key issue. It's an issue, but it's not certainly the issue. And as such, I think the staff report right now, as it is, um, without some kind of amendment, shouldn't be submitted to the county. Okay, thank you. Uh, Heather, if you would like to uh, make comments, go ahead. Thank you. 
Um, good evening, Mayor Woodbury, Council members, ladies and gentlemen. I want to address uh, some key issues of the staff report for Wilder Lake subdivision. There are many, but for time tonight, I'm going to focus on these. The first is the Lake Parent Capacity Study. It's a requirement of the County of Gray official plan. It is proposed to be waived, and it simply cannot be waived. The flow of water is only one element in the impact to the lake. The lake itself is the key selling feature for this development. The purpose of the study would be to determine the current state of the lake, to establish an upset limit for future development, to ensure the integrity of the lake environment is maintained. Has to be done. Second, storm water management ponds. It's an infrastructure responsibility of the township. The discussion portion of the staff report states the township prefers not to take on the ownership maintenance of these lots. It's not an option. The township has to do it as part of infrastructure. As the staff report states, the township expects significant growth in assessment from this proposed subdivision. The expense comes with the potential income. Simple. There needs to be a separate easement for the dock. It cannot be part of Block 30. Otherwise, it becomes public, public property and a potential liability for the township. Access to the lake. The developer has intentions of keeping two existing buildings. Burnside Engineering Report point number 34 has asked the developer what the purpose of the remaining buildings will be. The developer's reply was that they would be non-inhabitable. Not sure what that means. The developer did not answer Burnside's question. And specific clarification of the building's use is required prior to approval. Third, staff report discussion on dark sky and night lighting. The holding simple is simply requiring the developer to abide by proper lighting during construction. But removing this holding symbol when title changes to the homeowner is unacceptable. This has to be part of the subdivision agreement with the homeowner being held accountable to abiding by a bylaw. They cannot change the type of lighting or add excess lighting and pollution to neighbors. One of the major issues addressed at the public meeting and not addressed in the staff report is short-term rentals which would need to include the developer's intended use of these remaining two buildings. Another issue is lot vegetation cutting and planting. A draft subdivision agreement is required prior to approval to indicate how these will be addressed. In conclusion, we propose the deferral of submitting this staff report with the township's conditional approval to the County of Gray until the late carrying capacity study has been completed Issues have been resolved and a draft subdivision agreement has been prepared and shared addressing these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rob, if you would like to give your say, please. Sure. <clears throat> Thanks, John. Uh, everyone can hear me, I assume? Yes, very well. Great. Great. Okay. So, hi, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, my name is Rob Caprini and I am a property owner on Wilder Lake. Today, the planning department will submit its report regarding the Wilder Lake subdivision. I would like to address my main point of concern, which is the water quality of Wilder Lake. Although I have not had time to review it thoroughly, the Burnside Engineering Report that was posted on the township website Monday has one point in particular that concerns me. Point number three. In that point, both Burnside and the developer acknowledge that the runoff from the eight lakefront lots discharges directly into Wilder Lake with no quality control. The developer thinks this is fine. I disagree. My wife and I have been testing the water in Wilder Lake since 2012. During that time, the algae problem and the level of phosphorus in the lake has been increasing. 
runoff from lakefront lots is one of the main contributors of phosphorus to lake water. It's estimated that one pound of phosphorus can create up to 700 pounds of algae, or to put it simply, a 700 to one ratio. Please do not ignore point number three in that report. We need to build in protection for Wilder Lake now, so that in five years, when there will inevitably be fewer trees, more fertilizer, more concrete driveways and patios, and more buildings on these lakefront lots, we will have at least done something to protect the lake from toxic blue-green algae. If the pandemic has taught us anything in Ontario, it is that if government listens mainly to the interests of developers and big business, then we can all end up in a big mess. I urge council to revisit point number three in the Burnside report and not accept the developer's response. Thank you very much. Thank you. I well, appreciate uh, always anyone that uh, steps up and uh, has anything to say at uh, open forum. Uh, it's always good to hear from everybody. Um, next, we'll move on to confirmation of the agenda. Moved by Martin, seconded by Jason, uh, that uh, we confirm the agenda as amended. Any discussion? Mayor Woodbury. Yep. Go ahead, uh, Lindsay. Would someone, someone be able to move an amendment to move up the correspondence consent items? We have the um, integrity commissioners on the line. Our periodic report from the integrity commissioners is on the correspondence consent agenda. It would just save them waiting around till near the end of the meeting if, if council would move that amendment, just the correspondence consent item, okay. which is 10.3. All right, Brian's going to move it and Barb's going to second it. I see their hands and then Martin waved to me. So uh, so that's the uh, agenda, confirming the agenda as amended with the uh, Integrity Commissioner's report moved up. Barb, do you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is that the only amendment that was what you were referring to as amended? Yes, that's what I was going to suggest. I'm fine seconding it. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, any other discussion on that? Hearing none, is anyone opposed to that motion? Okay, that is carried. So we're going to move up to uh, 10.2.1, and that's the Integrity Commissioner's uh, periodic report. Uh, do we need a, a motion for that, Lindsay, or we'll receive it later? Uh, let's just, for the sake of moving it up, we'll move a motion to receive it as information. Okay, so I need a mover and seconder to Barb will move it and Martin will second that. Good evening. I uh, just we heard you speak at uh, County Council not too long ago, so it's uh, good that you're you're back here. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just looking at the screen here. Uh, you will see Jeff Abrams, uh, my partner, is also on the screen somewhere, uh, and yep. I'm Janice. Pekofsky, and thank you for making the time and thank you very much for moving us up on your agenda. We really appreciate this. Um, this is a, a periodic report uh, and we are your integrity commissioner and so we're bringing you sort of a, a summary of where, where you are. Uh, sometimes we bring these more frequently than annually or more frequently I should say than periodically but um, we haven't, uh, we've fallen behind a little bit with the pandemic so we owe you this, um, but um, we would first take a couple of minutes just to make sure that uh, certainly the listening public is aware uh, that um, you are well served uh, with, a, with an integrity commissioner and that as you were obligated to, you have a code of conduct. And uh, we wanted to make sure that you understand uh, that we are a resource to you um, for the purpose of seeking advice and that type of thing. So integrity commissioners uh, are often thought of as the uh, hammer that comes in to investigate and come down on the heads of a member of council or local board for transgressions. And we really like to um, characterize our role as much different than that. We hold ourselves as a coach and teacher 
And we think that the most valuable thing that an integrity commissioner can do in serving uh, a municipality and its local boards is to provide confidential advice to members when they uh, are in a bit of a gray area where there's an issue of uh, uh, conduct or a conflict of interest uh, that arises that they may not be certain of how to deal with. So that is first and foremost an important role for integrity commissioners uh, across Ontario in their uh, municipalities. So that is a role that we serve for you. Now, um, in this report, we do note that uh, we have not had the opportunity, we've not been asked to provide uh, advice to members of council, and that may be that there's no uh, issues that, that have arisen, and that's a very good thing. Uh, but we just wanted to make you aware that we are here if you require that kind of advice. Um, integrity commissioners also um, provide training, and we did provide training to you uh, back at the beginning of our uh, appointment uh, in April of 2019, and we we're happy to do so, and uh, we're available to do so if there's a need uh, going forward. Um, but uh, we are uh, the other uh, area that we cover off, of course, is responding to complaints, and the good news is. Uh, that for Southgate, there have been no complaints coming to us. When we do get complaints, of course, we look to resolving, if possible, through course correction, um, whether it's through um, uh, undertaking different uh, actions, uh, improvements in those actions, et cetera. We always look to informal resolution when we can. So. Uh, even when we have complaints, very often they will not result in a public recommendation report because we are able to resolve those informally between the complainants and respondents. But as I say, in, in uh, Southgate, we have not had any complaints and that's a very good thing. So one of the things we do in our periodic reports is just provide a little bit of uh, overview of themes that we see around the province from our vantage point, we serve over 40 municipalities as integrity commissioner, as well as a school board and uh, other bodies. So we are able to provide a bit of overview as to what we're seeing across the province. One of the areas that we see issues arise in and members uh, often have concerns about uh, involves conflicts of interest. And so one of the areas that comes up from time to time frequently uh, is when members of council are also members of uh, another body and when that other body has an interest before council. So let's say um, an organization or a club whose interest may be impacted by a decision of council. And so we provide advice to members uh, in those circumstances. Um, we uh, certainly, um, are um, very aware of the uh, work that was done in the Collingwood Judicial Inquiry and the report that came out in November from uh, uh, former um, Justice Morocco, which makes recommendations to the province with respect to um, better guidance in the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, and uh, notably referencing that um, members need to be aware of um, the broader concept of conflicts of interest, not strictly those that are under that act, but rather the common law concept, which is addressed in the code. So um, again, when areas uh, of concern do arise, we encourage you to reach out uh, for advice. Another area that is frequently a concern uh, that we look at, that we see in other municipalities, is the issue of respect and non-disparagement. And uh, we see this arise uh, sometimes in the context of social media. So we just referenced this in the report. Uh, it's an area of concern. Members, of course, uh, are entitled to disagree on all manner of issues. And uh, of course, it's a cornerstone of our democracy uh, that uh, people are entitled to their own opinions and perspectives. but in all matters, uh, members should be respectful and not allow uh, differences 
dissolve into disrespect, uh, disparagement, or name calling. And so we see this from time to time, uh, as well as I say in social media, where members will engage in social media and sometimes lose sight of the fact that they are still bound by uh, good conduct and decorum as required by the, the code. So I, I think um, that's an area that uh, from time to time arises. Another area that we see uh, not infrequently is where members attempt to take the reins of a problem to fix a constituent's problem themselves rather than redirecting um, the uh, constituent to the appropriate staff. So, of course, uh, all members of council have uh, an obligation to uh, be available to their constituents, but it's really important to understand where the handoff should be. So it's one thing to field the uh, question from the constituent, but it's very um, important to recognize when you should be handing that off to a staff member and not stepping in and trying to do uh, whatever operational or administrative function is being requested. Um, they, I think uh, overall, um, what we expect to, to hear is uh, from our municipal council clients is that from time to time, we will be uh, contacted for advice. And so a concern uh, is if we don't hear anything at all, then we believe it's possible that uh, members of council and local boards uh, don't know where to turn for the advice. So that's one of the purposes, I think, of speaking to you this evening is just to make sure you are comfortable, you're aware who we are. And, uh, you know, we often joke, and it's not too tongue in cheek, that who on earth would reach out to a complete stranger for advice? So here we are, we're before you, you're in, we're your integrity commissioner. We hope to have some uh, amount of a relationship that you will feel comfortable if you have some concern don't hesitate reach out and we're happy to to serve otherwise uh, from the perspective of complaints this is a very good news story there are none coming to us with respect to any of the activities in Southgate so and we're happy to take any questions thank you uh I think that uh, we're really blessed here with uh, a group that disagrees on a lot of things, but it's very uh, respectful and helpful for each other. So uh, we've been doing really well. Brian, I see you have a, a question or comment. Thank you, uh, John. Um, Janice, you spoke, uh, one of your points was that you don't see uh, infrequently is the matter of um, conflicts uh, with people that sit on multiple organizations and of course in a small community that's sometimes tough because people and I'm sure this group assembled here this evening probably sit on a multitude of different organizations are you suggesting that uh, if you're an elected official that you probably shouldn't uh, participate in the governance of a local say an egg society or a lions club or something of that nature uh, no, thank you very much for that question. No, not at all. Um, I I should be more clear. Um, of course, in a small community, uh, often the elected officials who end up running and being elected are those who are most involved. So certainly we don't discourage that. We simply flag uh, for members that if the the one of those other bodies on which the member is uh, sitting come before council with a request, an application or a request for a grant or something of that nature, then that body uh, has a pecuniary interest in the matter before council. So the member, by virtue of the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, has a conflict and has to declare it. It's an indirect interest, but it's still a pecuniary interest and must be declared. Um, and so it's in those sort of, um, I would say, not unusual, but, um, you know, somewhat irregular occasions when the service club, for example, is before council seeking a grant 
then the member who's a member of that service club should be declaring interest and stepping away. Very good. Okay, that, thank you very much for the clarification. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, were there any other questions or comments? Barbara. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hello, Jeffrey and Janice. Thank you for joining us. Just to um, expand a little bit on Deputy Mayor Milne's comment, it doesn't preclude us from volunteering for an event or, uh, I mean, it's the governance aspect that you're suggesting, being a member or in the, as, as part of those making the decisions to approach council for for funding or event space or things like that but but you know the fall fair we all volunteer to flip burgers or sweep floors that's not what you're referring to uh no through the mayor no that's not what we're referring to and that's a, a very good distinction there is all there are all sorts of activities that uh, uh any one of you are probably at any given time volunteering for um Sometimes though, context is always important. And so on some of these, it's, it is nuanced. And so uh, it's not, I, I think we would say there's not a blanket rule that not sitting on the executive is a green card, for example, uh, because there are organizations that um, sometimes members of council belong to where even being a member uh, puts them in a, a circumstance where it would give rise to a conflict of interest. So there's different roles that members of council play. Sometimes they're on the executive. Sometimes at the other end of the continuum, they're simply volunteering to help set it up or clean up afterwards or flip burgers. And in that middle ground, sometimes they are members. And so on those, we like to just make sure that uh, the member is um, that we are understanding the context of the question so we can give the advice. It's, Thank you. And it's, it's really only when those bodies come before council with a request. So. Thank you. It's, and just one other question, if I may, Mr. Chair. Sure. I'm not sure if everyone is aware. Uh, we It's been out for a couple of weeks and I'm pretty sure that you're aware of it. There's a code of conduct survey being conducted by the province and to establish, to get opinion and feedback on where the codes of conduct could be improved or the penalties be made more severe or whatever the outcome of that will be. Will you as integrity commissioners be providing your uh, input based on you know, your recent experience in the last couple of years as integrity commissioners and where you see there being some areas for improvement? Um, thank you for that question. And I, I was uh, uh, neglectful and not even referencing that consultation. Yes, um, we are involved and we will be involved. We're not directly involved with the province's consultation at this moment, but we're very involved with the uh, organization uh, of Municipal Integrity Commissioners of Ontario, which we are a part of. And actually, Jeff and I play, I would say, a very leading role or a leadership role in that organization. We're talking about a group of maybe two dozen or so integrity commissioners across Ontario. Um, and we, between, with Principles Integrity, we are integrity commissioner to about 10% of the municipalities in Ontario represent about a third of the population. So quite a significant uh, portion. And we have actually had meetings with MECO, the Municipal Integrity Commissioners of Ontario, to try to coalesce around some agreed principles before we share our position. But we will be sharing a position and we're also engaged in speaking at a couple of um, symposiums uh, in this regard in preparation of, of uh, that position. The, and, and so that that consultation, the intention of that consultation doesn't strike fear into the hearts of municipal elected officials everywhere. Uh, it, it is a bit of a 
reaction, I dare say, to a pretty egregious circumstance that was reported on uh, in Ottawa by uh, Integrity Commissioner Marlowe uh, a few months back with respect to some pretty outrageous um, sexual harassment uh, which was going on for a period of time. And it's, of course, an extreme situation that's caused the province to begin the consultation, but we're we're hoping that the result is basically um, just a reinforcement of a lot of what already exists and maybe with a few tweaks. So yeah. if I could just add, sorry, Janice, mm -hmm. if, I could, if I could just add to Janice's comments. So we are, we're hopeful that this, con the entire consultation won't be simply about these two or three rare events that occur and that it will be a meaningful discussion about codes of conduct, training for integrity commissioners, discussions about penalties and, and that sort of thing in a, in a healthful way. One of the things we're concerned about is that it will become uh, so focused on those rare events that entire processes will be built for those rare events that will impact the relatively accessible and quick and inexpensive processes that coaches and teachers like to employ as they help councils do some course corrections from time to time. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Barb. Thank you very much. I, I too um, am interested and I think that the, the municipalities that have had to go through an, an integrity commissioner's investigation with outcomes that may seem to some people um, you know a little bit why did we bother um, because because of the penalties that may be suggested but i agree that it, you know you can make it too strict whereby you're not nobody would want to do this <laughs> um, so i'm looking forward to to finding out about the comments about your experience i mean having your input into the process because as you said you represent 10 percent of the municipalities in ontario therefore who best to realize where something is working and where something needs tweaking so thank you very much for that thank you thank you has anyone else uh, any comments or questions Okay, seeing none, I'd like to thank both of you for uh, coming here and, and uh, sharing with us tonight. Uh, greatly appreciate it and uh, nothing personal, but I, I hope we don't see you in the near future. <laughs> Take care. Thank, thank you, you so much. Have a nice evening. Okay, we have that motion before us to receive this um, for information. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, is anyone opposed to it? And I'll declare that passed, thank you. Um, any declaration of pecuniary interest, you can declare now or at any time through the meeting. Brian, you have one. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will be declaring an, issue, uh, 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 an interest in report number PL 2021-032- Walders Lake subdivision. The nature of the, the interest is the applicant is a family member. Okay. So I'll, thank be you. Or I'll be recusing myself from that discussion. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and for anyone else, you can declare now or, or at any other time through the meeting. Um, next, we'll go on to the adoption of the minutes. Moved by uh, Martin, seconded by Jason. And these are the minutes from April 7th meeting and the closed session meeting. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, anyone opposed? Declare that passed. Uh, next, we'll move on to uh, Jim, your uh, report uh, about the Dundalk Reserve capacity. And that is moved by uh, Michael and seconded by Jim. So there you are, Jim, go ahead. Good evening, good people. Um, yes, this is an annual report that comes uh, 
about the uh, water and wastewater system capacities in Dundalk. And uh, as you can see through the tables, there's a, a lot of uh, uncommitted, um, or sorry, committed that isn't uh, underway just yet, but uh, we've, we've uh, put uh, that in place. But um, the water's still in very good shape and the uh, wastewater in, in some ways we've gained again, because we still have 127 units uh, available. Um, this report here took into consideration extraneous flows and looked at uh, what uh, drinking water goes into the system should balance somewhat out in the wastewater end of things. And you can see that there's a lot of uh, infiltration that's happening and uh, inflow. And um, we've identified with some of our own work uh, with uh, monitoring manholes and uh, doing some other investigations that uh, there are a number of sump pumps that are connected to the system. And there's a possibility of a, a big gain if we can get those out of the system for the wastewater. So we will be working. Uh, we may not be the most favorite people on the street when we uh, start uh, implementing some of these, uh, get them out of the system uh, orders to the people, but uh, it certainly will help uh, in the wastewater capacity. Okay, thanks Jim. <clears throat> That's something that uh, I know Works Department's been chasing back. <laughs> I remember them looking at it back in the 90s uh, in Dundalk, so uh, yeah, it'll be it'll be something, anyways. Any questions or comments on Jim's report, Martin? Good evening, Jim. Um, mm -hmm. I was looking. Yeah, good evening. I was looking at page thirty-four, and as you just mentioned, uh, with the system being hooked up to maybe not a lot of sump pumps, but obviously a significant amount. How is the uh, white rose there I, I thought it was building code that every code has to have a sump pump now and it has to go somewhere so you're looking at a lot more water coming in because of that development because it's it's being built next to wetland a uh, high water table those pumps are going to be running quite a bit you can't get rid of those pumps so do you think that development is going to be a hassle for you guys in the few years when it's all done go ahead Jim because it will certainly add to it. No, they shouldn't be, Martin, because uh, th these systems now have a stormwater uh, connection to put those sumps okay. into stormwater management areas and take it to the ponds. So those, okay. it's the older systems that have more of the issue. Um, mm -hmm. We still have another development from a while ago that um, some of it's partially uh, got stormwater connections and part of it doesn't. So some of that area does have some concerns we're looking at. Um, we'll have to weed them out. But uh, the newer developments, uh, we've done some flow monitoring study on them and that's where we've been able to base some of our uh, numbers and uh, correlate them to the ministry on new developments. So the new developments are a lot tighter. Okay. okay. Thank you, Barbara. That's good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Through you, uh, and to clarify for anyone who's listening, please correct me if if I've misunderstood, Jim. It's not getting eliminating the sump pumps or removing sump pumps. It's redirecting where the flow of water when the sump pump is working goes. I recall when living in another city. Uh, when the houses were built, the storm water was going into a, um, like right down into the pipes rather than flowing off. And they mandated that all of those be capped off and removed. So is that what you're referring to? We're going to, um, like the Flato and the White Rose developments, they're building into their development storm water management. Um, what do you see happening with the existing homes that 
may be in flow into the sewage treatment, the lagoons. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, so they may have some more internal uh, connections for their sump pumps that we're uh, starting to see um, with flow events and uh, low flow events, how, what's coming into the system and why. Um, but we're not, the, the idea will be that they'll have to get them out of the, that sanitary pipe and get it back onto the surface flowing out the backyard or somewhere for a surface discharge, as opposed to going into absolutely the, the sanitary is what we want to get that water out of. If there's a storm water available, we made them available all along Main Street East with the reconstruction. The opportunities are there for people to connect and maybe we'll have to start working on a force connect bylaw to help enforce. We do have, Latitude in our bylaw, but we may need more to go with. So, okay. Michael, did you have something? Thank you. I'm yeah, just curious when you see uh, residents pumping the water out of their basement through their sump pump out onto the sidewalk going onto the road, um, is that what you're wanting people to do? No, absolutely okay. not. It needs to go where it's not going to interfere definitely with the sidewalk or the road. So we've had to deal with some of those instances uh, just recently this winter, but that they need to go to a, an outlet that goes more likely rear drainage if possible, or um, if there's some other systems that are partially built for a swale or something in between that uh, they they point that direction of their discharge into those areas. So, no, we don't want that flow on sidewalks or roads. Follow-up question? Yep. So, when we put the connections um, across from the Dundalk Herald there, so where is that water going to end up then? Sorry, uh, mm -hmm. the Dundalk Herald on Main Street? Yeah, when we put in, there's going to be that new uh, building that's going in there and to alleviate some of the water problem between Doris Langdon and the uh, uh, McMillan Jack Funeral Home, we put connections in there so that water would be draining. So where is that water going to drain from, from that property? Well, it hasn't, that uh, system has a pipe underneath and it also has the overflow to take the, the extraneous flows with the, uh, precipitation and those snow melt events, but everything else should be inside the pipe, going in the pipe and heading for the underground outlet. Which is going to the wastewater treatment plant? No, they're going to uh, some of the, the, they're not officially municipal drains, but the drainage system created throughout the town and uh, those creeks, some people may call them, um, but those type of uh, streams, those drainage ditches designed, that's okay. where that water is heading for. That's where we want all the water to go to. For, for some pumps and that kind of, yes, anything that doesn't belong in sanitary. Okay. Okay, thanks. Barb? That made me think about something I, I read um, in social media as someone emptying their pool. So where are people emptying their pools? I suspect they're, or when they're backwashing their pools is going into, off into the road or into the, the down the down the manholes. Um, and that's not what you want. No, absolutely not. Um, that water should be dechlorinated before it even hit uh, a, a stream because it could mm -hmm. affect uh, fish for a kill. But um, yeah, you see it uh, quite often, how people uh, get rid of their pool water at the end of the season or the startup. Yeah, but that's where that water should be going. It should be staying on land and, and uh, being dealt with that way, as opposed to on the road, on the sidewalk. And like I mentioned, it should be dechlorinated. So it sounds like we've got an education uh, opportunity coming coming forward. 
Thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, anyone else? Dave? Yeah, there's another there's another piece to this uh, reserve capacity that we haven't really talked about, and it's uh, the efficiency of the new homes is a big deal. Uh, so there's not only efficiency that they're they're consuming less water, and I'll talk about that, but there's also the efficiency that they're discharging their 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 ground or their uh, floor drains into uh, a stormwater system. Where I'm going with is is um, they are consuming less water right from the start by not having toilets that flush as much water. They have diffusers on their shower heads and their and their sink faucets that use less water. Um, so those are important things to really, um, if we can, can get some of these new homes converted to those kind of uses and get rid of the uh, diversion of uh, of uh, the drain water into a storm system rather than our wastewater system, um, that's really grabbing capacity that we don't have to build for the future. Really, really important. Yeah, thanks. Okay, I don't see anyone else with comments. So uh, is anyone opposed to that motion? Seeing none, that's carried. Thanks, Jim. That was kind of a, a good news story all around, really, for us. Helps out a bit. Uh, next, we'll move on to some Dave's reports. Uh, 7.2.1, which is moved by Jason, seconded by Barbara, and it's the uh, Southgate Vacancy Tax Rebate Program. <clears throat> Dave, did you want to add anything to this? The only thing I want to add is that while we're, we're, we were feverishly working at uh, drafting um, a support resolution for the rest of the County of Gray, I guess the province is working uh, and they brought down uh, the uh, change in, in regulations through, uh, and I'm just uh, looking, digging it up here, but I'm sure you've read the report in relation to a new Ontario reg that allows lower tiers to have the powers to to uh, adopt their own vacancy tax rebate policy. So uh, what we're recommending here is that we uh, proceed to uh, cancel vacancy tax rebates. Uh, whole, uh, we're looking at Jan July 1st, so that's kind of a half year split, but uh, we, you know, we'll, we'll give that direction to uh, the treasurer. And if there's anything that they see coming out of that, we may need to change that date, but we'll we'll go with that date for now. Okay, great. Any questions, comments? Barbara? Thank you. Through you, Dave. Um, I had that question about is July the phase in period, which, you know, gives them half a year, those who have applied. Um, is, is that, is that all like, they wouldn't be eligible for the tax rebate this year or would they be eligible for the tax rebate for half a year? But by 2022, they're being given notice, it's going to be, there. there's no more vacancy tax rebate. Yeah, so th that's a, an excellent clarification that we should make is as of right now, uh, it would be a July 1st we would end and that would end the vacancy tax rebate. Um, if council wants to see more transition, we can do that and transition, you know, in, in 2022. But uh, that was a date we put down as, uh, you know, let's, it's, it's uh, been a, a program that hasn't been productive and uh, staff really feel we're better to invest in community improvement rather than uh, providing an incentive for a rebate on taxes for empty buildings. Mm -hmm. That's one we've talked about at this table a few times. Uh, Martin. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, Dave, on page 44, uh, it does say, where is it? If we need a vacancy tax rebate program, that's up to staff and council then. If somebody does say, look, I wanna, I wanna renovate this building, give me a break for a year, because you do say it's very time sensitive and up to no more than 12 months, would that still yes. be applicable? So, so there is I some mean, if you had, recourse. Sure, and, and I think uh, if you wanted to, if if uh, someone wanted to, you know, 
apply and say, hey, I'm doing this, it's going to make things. But I think we could address, uh, look at it. But as of right now, I think there's enough tools in our toolbox to help through the CIP rather than a vacancy yeah. tax rebate. But we can open it up anytime. It's it's the powers that we have here in Southgate to, to make those uh, uh, changes. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you because uh, the two the two words that struck out to me first when I read it was the chronic vacancy and absentee landlords, and that's not a good thing. So, uh, yeah, good report. Okay. It's good to see. Okay. Any further questions or comments? Okay. Seeing none. Anyone opposed to the motion? And that is carried. Uh, next, we have the bylaw to go with it. That's 7.2.2. Uh, that is moved by Michael and seconded by Jim. Anyone have any questions or comments on the bylaw? Okay, then Lindsay, I'll get you to do the vote. We may have lost the oh. No, oh, there she is. There she is. She was just hiding. She's moving too. Yep. Uh oh, I we think. lost your volume. I think. Vacancy tax. Now you're muted. Uh oh. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I had to come back in on my phone. So, recorded vote for bylaw 2021-054, the vacancy tax rebate program. Mayor Woodbury. Yes. Deputy Mayor Milne. Yay. Councillor Dobreen. In favor. Councillor Rice. Yes. Councillor Shearson. Yes. Councillor Frew. Yes. Councillor Shipston. Yes. By a vote of seven to zero, that's carried. Thank you. Uh, next, we move on to 7.2.3, which is moved by Brian, seconded by Martin, and that's the uh, Affordable Housing Advisory Committee report. Uh, Dave, if you'd like to make any comments on this. The only comment I'm going to make is, is, uh, and I, I, I know there's a question possibly coming and maybe I'm going to stem it off, but uh, I struggle a little bit because I know when the uh, delegation presented, they talked about attainable and I'm using the word affordable. I think they go hand in hand and I think maybe affordable is a bit tougher to reach. Um, because uh, attainable, but whatever we want to call it, we can call it both. But I think we should challenge the uh, the uh, uh, committee to you know look at both attainable and affordable, and uh, maybe better define that. Uh, maybe there's different understandings of affordable and attainable, but in my mind, affordable is something that people can afford to live in based on their incomes. You know, attainable. Um, maybe less of a stretch for, but again, that definition, I think maybe the committee needs to define it and determine what we want to do, but I think they need to look at all those kind of uh, issues, uh, both rental and purchase and so on. And I see there's a question. Yep, Barb. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> uh, yes, I was going to uh, suggest that we just, simply call it the Housing Advisory Committee, because I, I really do agree with you, Dave, that we're going to be asking them to explore all kinds of housing options, whether that be um, for uh, assist, you know, seniors housing, attainable housing, workforce housing, affordable housing. And I think our goal is to um, have a, a diverse supply uh, throughout Southgate and to 
restrict or to have the connotation of, you know, it's affordable and that's what we're going to focus on. And I think your, your terms of reference captures, you know, all kinds of avenues that they can explore. And um, if they want to come back and they come up with a really clever uh, catch-all phrase, uh, we could certainly uh, consider that as well. I think this is a great opportunity to um, address the the lack of housing supply. I mean, we have a lot of houses, but it may not be the type of housing that some people are in need of at the present time. And I, you know, whether that's garden suites or whether that's secondary suites, you know, all of that comes into play. So. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to this getting off the ground and, and I know that uh, others are, are really pleased to see it come forward so quickly. So thank you, Dave, for uh, jumping on it right away and, and bringing something forward. It's very much appreciated. Okay, thanks. Uh, Martin. Thanks, John. Yeah, Dave, uh, I was really happy to read this uh, report and I've always had an issue with the affordable and attain, attainable. It's so subjective. You know, a person making 300,000 years might not be able to afford his house, vice versa. And, and I heard today on the radio that the, the Georgian Triangle and the prices just have gone out of reach again and broke new records. So if, if, uh, if they can come up, as Barb said, Council Green said about having a catchy name, just calling it housing advisory, that will uh, encompass all things and that's what we have to do because there's all different kinds of people living in this township so i think it was a good start just a comment okay thank you any other comments or questions okay hearing none uh, i had a comment mr ryan uh, oh, do you? Comment. Okay, ryan, go ahead. yeah strangely enough um yeah. thank you uh thank you john um I'm I'm kind of two minds here. Um, I, I like the notion of of finding out, you know, what the local angle or, or or ideas might be. But on the other hand, I I think we don't have to look too far to know what can be done. There's been study after study after study by various planning departments social services departments, and I'm not talking just in Gray County, I'm talking right across the province. I think we know what the problem is. We know what the options are. Uh, in my mind, maybe it's time to stop talking and s um, I want to get the right word here. <laughs> uh, maybe it's time to, to um, act and and put some of these things in place i.e i'm thinking off the top of my head i'm thinking there's a number of planning options clint could list off what we could do um to uh make some attainable affordable housing within a subdivision with uh, developers there's options there now in the planning act why aren't we acting on them if we, if we truly think, and I agree, this is an issue, then why don't we just act on it? Why do we have to take another year, another year and a half to look at this? I, I, I fail to see that we're gonna come up with anything different than anybody else has in terms of ideas. Let's act on some of them and get this boat off the dock. There you go, that's all my comments there. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Go ahead, Dave. So there was a lot packed into those comments and, and maybe I'll try and unpack it. Um, I think uh, affordable, attainable, whatever we want to call it. And I'm going to, I'm going to comment back to Barb's comment of, uh, I'd like to leave it at affordable because I think that's the toughest threshold uh, to create affordable housing and then take, let the committee decide what they want to call the committee and send that report, that idea or that suggestion back. Because I think um, we have a lot of opportunities. The next thing I'll comment is to, to uh, Brian is uh, the deputy mayor made some points that, but I think, and I'm not going to blame them, but the province and, and the and the county 
have uh, have talked a lot about this, but there's not been an emphasis, I think, at the lower tier to really get the shovels out and make something happen. And I think this committee could have the opportunity to do that, to really, because we've got some projects, we've got developers, we've got people that I think if we give them a nudge uh, or work with them, um, we have we have an opportunity for a variety of types of housing. And I'm thinking of uh, the new people that are coming to uh, Five Keppel Street, um, that uh, flex modular, they, they can be part of this in their type of housing that they provide. And uh, but maybe we need to do some things on the planning side, like uh, the deputy mayor suggested that, you know, can we create these uh, tiny home developments? But we keep talking about all these tiny home developments, but can we put policy in the new official plan that can actually cite two or three or four and shared services? So I think those are the kind of discussions because we got to stop uh, providing homes only at, 400,000 and up in this community. And we got to get homes that are down in that lower price range through shared services, shared lots, shared driveways, or more um, you know, types of uh, uh, homes like we see on 89 in a development like uh, um, that they have. So multiple people on one property. But I, I, think, I think this allows a committee to get at it. And uh, if we can get some uh, early wins and uh, some development going on in this area, focus more on apartments and focus more on maybe a condo type uh, that are, are less, uh, less uh, are more affordable and less costly. But um, I think we have an opportunity to actually have a lot of focus and push to make things actually start to happen. Okay, thanks. Brian, I'll let you and then Barbara. Can I, can I follow up there just real briefly? Yeah. Um, I can see I, that. I, I won't on your argue, face. and I'm, I won't. Yeah, I won't <laughs> argue, and I'm not going to disagree with uh, with Dave. But he just listed probably half a dozen options that we have now, right now, that we could do to change our planning policies to affect some change to some housing in the township, right there, right now. And yet we're going to spend another year, probably, with a committee talking about those very solutions. That's all. Okay, and I and I'll respond to that through the mayor if I may. Yep. Um, but we need to we need to have some um, some input, I think, and some some feedback from some of the community on what needs to go into the official plan to do that. And that's why we're heading down the road. There's some of those tools we don't have right now, so we got to change and create policy uh, that will provide us those tools to maybe put three or four tiny homes on one property. Maybe there's no interest in the community in that. I don't know. But until we explore it, we won't know. But we will need that push to not have this sitting around. This will have to, to yeah. get at it. Barbara, and then Martin. Through you and to Dave's point, this isn't just about you know rehashing everything that's already in place, but to explore how we can I mean, we can throw all kinds of things into a bucket and, you know, pull something out of, pull, pull a piece of paper out and say, okay, we're going to do that this week. But we need a plan and we need to have county involvement and social housing and we need to, to understand the planning aspects and the community needs to understand what resources we have at our disposal and how we can change policy to Dave's point over the next 12 months. Hopefully we can get some quick wins like Dave suggested and move on those that we can and, ex and explore the more permanent long-term um, plans for housing, you know, through this whole process. So it's not just having a community and, and staff sitting at a table. It's going to bring in Everything that is, you know, the planners, the county, uh, explore options that are in other communities to Brian's point. Yeah, they're all out there, but we just don't want a mismatch. We don't want a, a quilt of, of or a, a puzzle where a couple of pieces end up being missed in the end of it. That's just my opinion. And thanks. Okay, thank you. Martin? 
Yeah, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> I was just going to mention, it's been quite a while now, but the Ontario government years and years and years ago put a plan, uh, a provincial plan out just to see how it would go. And I, it didn't last long. It was it was basically to stop all this sprawl going on. They, it was like building up instead of out. And the only ones who took advantage of that was all the condo builders in the, in the city. Um, so with, with this committee, maybe, as, as Dave said, we can say, look, we need some apartment buildings. Let it, let's build up. So that's all zoning. So the whole chat about this, this stuff been around, and it depends on the people who are developing, developing their market. So if we can get a say in something about what we want to see in the county, like Flato did with the seniors building, I thought that was great. So I think the community is going to be able to help with that along with all the things that are in place so okay great thank you yeah i don't see any other hands up for comments so i'll call the question is anyone opposed to the motion okay i'll declare that passed next we have 7.2.4 and that's the uh, white road subdivision Preliminary acceptance moved by Jason, seconded by Barbara. Uh, Dave, did you want to comment on that? I think the report speaks for itself and I'll just take questions. Okay, let's see if there are any. Any questions? Okay, seeing none, is uh, anyone opposed to the motion? Okay, I'll declare that passed. Next, uh, thanks for those reports, Dave. Next is uh, Kayla's report, uh, 7.3.1. And that's moved by Jim, seconded by Michael. And that's the uh, COVID-19 vaccination policy. Kayla, did you wanna add anything to that for us? Uh, I don't think I have too much to add. Just we did do some research uh, of what other local municipalities were doing and kind of followed the trend. Okay, thank you. No, looks looks good. Are there any comments or questions from uh, council on that? Martin? Yeah, I, I think it's a, uh, something that has to be done. Uh, I just want comment uh, where when it says, uh, well, between the federal feds and the province, there's no real clear mandate of of who can get the uh, vaccine. It's been very, very up and down. What because there's no mandate for everybody to get it from the government. Um, what if somebody What if somebody in the township refuses, saying, "I I drive that plow. I don't have to." Like, is there going to be ramifications? Are you going to make him do it? when the province isn't even making some people do it. Even I read in the Star today, uh, some of the, some of the uh, nurses aren't doing it right away. So is it gonna be mandatory eventually or choice? Ahead, Just Kayla. a question. All right, uh, so- Why they wouldn't. At the, at the <laughs> moment, that's not something that we can enforce. All we can do is encourage our employees I think right now it is a big hot topic item for uh, human rights. And as it stands, from my understanding, we can't, all we can do is encourage, we can't enforce somebody to get, we can't mandate it. Yeah. Okay, Jim? Well, that's what I meant, follow up, that's what I meant. Yep. We can't mandate it because the government hasn't mandated, but there's, yep. there's leeway and education on the township's part to, make it good yep for everyone yep so it's good okay. good report Kayla. go ahead jim once the numbers get up to about 75 or 80 percent will be mandated for the remainder to get the shots you can't leave 20 percent of the community available to individuals who are carriers of the COVID disease it will eventually become mandatory i got my shot yeah, and I think the way uh, way Kayla's got this report, that uh, it covers that once an a organ or a governing body larger than us uh, says it's mandatory, then 
we have to follow those rules. Dave, you had something to add then, Barbara? Yeah, I don't, I just want to maybe correct Councillor Fru and maybe Kayla can help me here, but I don't think it will ever be that we'll get to 100% because uh, human rights, you don't have to, as a person, take this shot. I mean, it's a, it's a personal choice. Uh, I find that unfortunate because I think uh, it's important for all of us to get the vaccination. But the government, uh, I mean, uh, I shouldn't say the government, but the health professionals are, are uh, you know, striving for to get that 70 percent. And then when we get to 70 percent, they're saying we were at herd immunity. And I guess so uh, that other 30 percent or 20 percent uh, or whatever it ends up being that don't get the shot, uh, they're at their own peril in relation to the disease. Um, and, uh, you know, they, if they get it, they get it and they'll be at their own peril, but we're supposed to be at herd immunity when we get there. The other thing I'd like Kayla just to comment on, and it's related to COVID, not vaccinations, but it is, um, is every week, maybe I'm wrong, maybe it's every two weeks, we seem to have another thing kind of thrown at us in relation to COVID. And the latest that comes with COVID and this kind of, you know, policy stuff is, is cleaning and I think it's maybe important just to, for Kayla to you know um, share with everyone that's on the call including counselors if you have your own business or whatever um, can you just talk for a second about COVID uh, in relation to this new cleaning thing as well um, please yep, sure. go ahead. So it's from a webinar that I was in uh, by an insurance company actually and they were saying how important it is to not only do your cleaning but to document it so we have now implemented cleaning logs so that we can document when our cleaning is done and to ensure that it is being done what exactly is being cleaned how often is it being cleaned and that's an important part of stopping the spread as well because as much as it doesn't live on surfaces forever it does live on it so it's important to do it and document it. Yep. Um, Barbara. Thank you. And thank you, Kayla, for the report. I, when I first started reading it, I was wondering, oh, you know, is this, a, we're gonna mandate, everybody has to have a shot, but I was pleased to read that it's, it's the township making it possible. It's the township is, providing opportunity for people to make the decision to go and get a vaccine. It's still their decision, but if they feel that they can't take time off work and the only appointment they could get was, you know, middle of the day, it's the, we are putting in place, you've written it very well, where we will accommodate wherever possible and encourage you to do so. Um, it's interesting you talk about the documenting of the cleaning protocols. It's almost like we need a full-time person just to, to keep up with all the regulations. And as soon as you think you've got a handle on it, they're, they're changing direction on you. And so kudos to you for staying on top of it, for attending those webinars and bringing the information back. Um, I, I, I think in, in terms of the flu vaccine where I, with all these variants, I don't see this being a two shot deal. There's, you know, we're, we'll be lucky to get our second shot or first shot, some of us, um, but you know, we may end up having to have annual vaccinations every year just to, to keep up with the ever changing variants. And, they haven't mandated the flu shot, so um, it'll be interesting to follow. So thanks for bringing the report. Yeah, Michael? Well, I'm not sure where to go with this. I'm kind of in between. I, I understand, you know, the importance of getting the flu shot, but every time something comes up, we got to do another policy, another report. Here at the township, we're doing it, but you think every small business in Gray County is doing the same thing, doing a separate policy for every one of these things that come up like this? Like, it just seems like a lot of wasted time and stuff. And now document for cleaning? Like, I mean, to me, it's, if you wanna go get the flu shot, you're told to go get the flu shot. They make it around the clock, weekends, 
you can get it whenever you want to get it. So I'm not quite sure why we need to go, you know, spend all this time on these things. It's just, it just seems like a lot of wasted money for some reason. But I understand the importance of it. But uh, I'm not quite sure why we got to keep doing a different policy, another policy, another policy. It just seems that that's all we're going to be doing is rewriting policies all the time. We'll have to hire another person just to look after that. Yeah, well, w one of the things that uh, that I know of from my previous work in that is Ministry of Labor. If anybody gets hurt or anything comes up, that's what they want to see is a thick book of policies. And it's unfortunate that we've gotten so far into the legality of things that we need to make up so many rules and policies for everything. But that's where we live right now, I think. Uh, any other questions or comments? OK. There are none. Is anyone a, opposed to this? And that is carried. Thank you, Kayla. Good work as usual. Um, Flint, we have some of your stuff here. 7.4.1, and that is moved by Brian and seconded by uh, Martin. And that's Paul S. Martin uh, zoning. Flint, did, oh, Barbara, go ahead. I was just wondering before we start with the planners reports and um, one in particular, could we have a short five minute recess? Well, we'll, we'll call it a break because it's really not enough time to go to recess. Go out and play in the, in the yard, I yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> um, let, let's make 10 minutes and, and then we'll go from there. So we're at, uh, let's say 825, okay? We'll be back Thanks at 825. Board. Thank yeah. you.
Just check, Jason, uh, are you there still? Yeah, I'm here. 
Oh, okay, good. Uh, we're just missing Michael, so we'll give him a, a minute and then we'll get right at the planning. I'm report. here, buddy. I'm here. There you are. Good. Okay, so we'll call the meeting back to order and we'll move on to uh, Clinton's reports here. 7.4.1 is uh, moved by Brian and seconded by Mark. Clint, anything you'd like to let us know about that one? <clears throat> okay, so this is, uh, uh, I'll call it a twofer report in the sense yes. that um, they originally applied for a uh, shop uh, to be located on the property. Um, it also includes the small little uh, residential lot that's actually, there's a notch sort of out of it there. Um, you can see uh, this, this was brought before the Committee of Adjustment and at that meeting, it, the, the committee granted uh, the severance to split it into two 50 acre parcels. And as part of that, that residential lot um, was to be merged back with the 150 acres. And uh, it's zoned then accordingly to recognize the reduced lot area. And so this uh, bylaw and report will effectively recognize that change and implement the consent, but also to uh, recognize the proposed uh, on-farm diversified use being the uh, industrial shop. So uh, that's sort of, a, it's a, a little different than my normal reports, but that is, uh, that's the gist of it. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I do remember that uh, kind of cleans things up there. Any questions or comments from council? Okay, seeing none. Uh, is anyone opposed to this motion? And that is carried. Next, we have 7.4.2, moved by Barbara, seconded by Jim, and it's the bylaw to go with that. Uh, are there any comments or questions on that? Okay, Lindsay, I'll get you to do the uh, vote for this, please. Thank you, uh, Mayor Woodbury. So recorded vote called for uh, zoning bylaw amendment C-1520, Paul S. Martin. Councillor Shipston? Yes. Mayor Woodbury? Yes. Councillor Rice? Yes. Deputy Mayor Milne? Yay. Councillor Frew? Yes. Councillor Dobreen? In favor. Councillor Shearson? Yes. By a vote of seven to zero, that's carried. Okay, thank you. 7.4.3, moved by Jason, seconded by Michael, and that's the uh, Sharp Farm Supplies. Uh, Clint? Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Woodbury. Uh, first, I want to just uh, note a correction. Uh, I wonder if Alicia would be able to bring up uh, a particular uh, um, shot, screenshot of the the uh, Winton Park grain elevators because you may notice in my report that the image isn't actually of the Swinton Park grain elevators. That's the image that's supposed to be in the report. Unfortunately, the wrong image was attached to the report. So um, that is the report, or sorry, the correct image uh, to go with the report. Uh, it is for uh, a site plan agreement and the site plan agreement uh, essentially putting in phasing to allow them to build a, a couple additional bins. I think three, maybe I can't, I don't have it up in front of me here. Mm -hmm. um, a, a couple extra bins to allow for storage uh, to then even out the traffic flow of the trucks so that they don't have to keep cycling things through as quickly and, and therefore reducing the amount of traffic that goes in and out of there. Um, the, the site plan will also uh, include landscaping uh, right along the property, the southern property boundary with all of those small lots there, as well as closer to the unit to mitigate some noise and dust as well. The, there's also provisions in there for the 
mitigation of noise and dust uh, with respect to installing aspirators on the on the uh, equipment and that sort of thing. And then when you get to stage two, that's when they would increase the uh, the number of bins, but also provide a secondary entrance then onto the side road being side road uh, 07. Uh, so that's the, the sort of nature of that uh, proposal. Um, it, as you're, you're likely aware, this has been sold recently to Sharp uh, uh, Farms, and uh, they're proposing to do a, to keep the business running, but they want to do a few changes to make it more efficient. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments from Council? Barbara? So through you, hi Clinton. Just to refresh my memory and um, maybe anyone else's, if they uh, the recollection, this this predates council. This council, I believe, and there these these mitigating efforts were through the public process. That and it's just now coming forward. Or is this something entirely new? Uh, no, you're correct. Um, there was a consent and a zoning put forward and an official plan amendment, I believe, put forward uh, at the, through the previous council um, when it was uh, Hensel yes. uh, was the company at the time. And uh, they've since sold it and they they didn't act on implementing any of the changes so they didn't apply for any permits to build any new structures or anything like that so they didn't require a site plan approval so it was the site plan approval that was required to implement all of the things that were discussed during the the um, planning process for the zoning being noise attenuation planting of trees all, all of that, yeah. the second entrance, all of that stuff, so. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, is anyone opposed to this motion? And I'll declare that uh, carried. Next, 7.4.4, which is moved by Brian, seconded by Martin, and it's the uh, bylaw to go with the site plan agreement. Any questions or comments on this? Okay, seeing none, Lindsay, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mayor Woodbury. So recorded vote for uh, site plan 7-21, Sharp Farm Supplies. Councillor Frew? Yes. Dep Deputy Mayor Milm? Yay. Councillor Rice? Yes. Councillor Shipston? Yes. Councillor Dobreen? In favor. Councillor Shearson? Yes. Mayor Woodbury? Yes. By vote of seven to zero, that's carried. Okay, thank you. Uh, 7.4.5, which is moved by Michael and seconded by Barbara, and that is the uh, Highway 10 property. Clint, did you want to add anything to this one? Um. Council has seen this one before. We did approve a site plan on this previously. However, um, the owner's uh, architect realized there was a, a, an error in terms of meeting the building code, uh, in terms of separations between the existing two-story building and the proposed uh, storage units at the back. It required, a, a, I believe it's a, let me just pull it up here. And it's really small. Um, required a nine meter setback or from from the existing two story building. And originally they had, I'll say 5.7 and therefore the architect um, wouldn't approve the drawings for them. Um, so they had to amend and they were in this already registered at that point. And so they had to come back and amend the agreement. And that's what this is doing is changing that as well as um, reducing the width of the entrance at the front. 
and gaining back a little green space, which then becomes permeable space for uh, infiltration and things like that. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments from council on that? All right, does anyone oppose to this motion? Declare that carried. Uh, next, we move on to 7.4.6, and that's the bylaw to go with it. And that is moved by Jim, seconded by Martin. Any questions or comments on uh, the site plan, the bylaw? Okay, seeing none, Lindsay, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Woodbury recorded vote called for site plan 8 uh, 21, the Highway 10 property. Councillor Dobrain? In favor. Councillor Shearson? In favor. Councillor Frew? Yes. Deputy Mayor Milne? Yay. Mayor Woodbury? Yes. Councillor Rice? Yes. Councillor Shipston? Yes. By a vote of seven to zero, that's carried. Okay, thank you. Next, 7.4.7, 7. uh, moved by Michael, seconded by Jason, and that's the Wilders Lake subdivision. Clint, if you'd like to add anything to that. Mr. Mayor, I just want to make it clear that I'm recusing myself because of the interest. Yes, thank you, Brian, for uh, reminding us on that. Okay, and uh, so Brian's turned off his camera and his microphone. Go ahead, Clint. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is ask Alicia to bring up attachment one to my report if she could. Okay. That's, it's very slow. It's coming in there, but slowly. Yep. <laughs> Internet isn't. Yeah, it's pretty slow. Um, yeah. it, it, in any case, um, I'll start talking and maybe by the end it'll have come in. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Yay. Um, okay, so the proposal uh, it is for 29 residential lots uh, on Wilders Lake. Uh, previously, this is part of the golf course, so these holes will be moved away from the lake so that they won't um, be utilized anymore. They will, they will be lots. Um, th these lands are, are within a set what we would consider in, in the official plan and in the provincial policy in the county official plan as a settlement area, being that the inland lakes and shoreline designation. And it, it was designated that back when the official plan was uh, first approved. And it's probably even a legacy one from back in the, the early 90s when the county plan was approved. Um, but it, it is a, considered a settlement area under the uh, official plan. And so with the 29 lots, there's also going to be a I'll call it a, an orphan lot, <laughs> being the golf course clubhouse restaurant. And then the remainder of the lands will be the, uh, the golf course itself. Um, there's proposed to be uh, three stormwater blocks. Uh, one of them is located next to the dock there or to the left of the dock uh, that's there. Uh, there's another one further south of that al along the uh, the road, and then one on the west side by the, the golf course uh, lands. So there's three golf courses, and one uh, change that's uh, been made even since this, this drawing is this drawing currently shows a, an easement uh, that goes across lot six, down to the dock. Now, 
<laughs> we've the initial discussions were that this that easement would be uh, included with the stormwater management pond as as that block, but um, in later discussions um, that that easement will will be a separate block all on its own. Um, so it'll have the the dock and the two existing cottages that are there or that are going to remain um and the uh lot six will then be free and clear from with not having any easements on it um it was brought up about the the use of those two cottages that are to remain and uh it's it's worded in in the uh proposed uh, draft plan conditions that they be used for one of them to be used as a change house for the dock and so both of them are going to be made non-habitable meaning there's not going to be any overnight accommodation there or anything of that nature there will be no toilets in them it will be um for other, it could be a picnic shelter or something of that nature or um, but there will not be any overnight accommodation in either of those two structures. Okay, um, so that that's the what the the proposal is in a nutshell. Um, as far as the process of what's what's happening now and what will happen uh, going forward is this is sort of the first stage in. Uh, it moving along through the the process i guess you could say so the township isn't the approval authority for plans of subdivision and that's that's what's before you right now um, the county of gray is the approval authority and that being said we provide comments and uh, conditions that we would like to see included in a draft plan approval to the county. They are then forwarded on to the county and then that is then dealt with with Randy Scherzer uh, who will review all of our comments. He will review all of the comments from the public meeting just like I have. He'll review any further comments that have come in. Um, a number of the submissions that were prepared tonight have also been forwarded on to him so he's aware of those and he will again make sure that the issues have been addressed in some fashion i say in some fashion because it may not be to the satisfaction of some individuals but they will have been addressed in some manner um, <clears throat> so following that then that after that detailed review the the county then will prepare a, a further planning report to go to county council recommending either approval or approval with conditions or or refusal depending and uh at that time it, it would receive a, a draft plan approval um, with a number of conditions one of those conditions is that a zoning bylaw amendment be, be approved. That zoning and bylaw amendment uh, will be brought forward by myself with a planning report. And that will be a second report with further review and further refinement of, of the issues. And um, that will be brought forward to council at a, at a, later, at a later meeting. Uh, that would also include a holding provision and that holding provision is to ensure that a, a subdivision agreement is entered into and I think it's very important that that holding provision is there to make sure the subdivision agreement is entered into um, first because there are a number of draft plan conditions as well as uh, concerns and matters of ownership that will be addressed in that subdivision agreement. So 
as an example, in my report, you, you'll notice I indicated that the ownership of the uh, stormwater blocks <coughs> um, in rural areas such as this, um, typically municipalities don't like to take on the ownership and maintenance of stormwater management blocks. Um, be mainly because of the a the cost and the the time it takes to bring all your equipment out to for to to service the these uh stormwater stormwater blocks and then bring it all back to where it is whereas if it's in in a settlement area like Dundalk or somewhere more concentrated then the travel times are less and there's some efficiencies there so that's one of the reasons um so in the and I say that's the preferred option. By no means is that settled. Um, one of the solutions to that that we had initially suggested was what they call a common element um, condominium, whereby the the stormwater management ponds and the dock block, for that matter, um, would be included in a common element co corporation, condo corp. And then that would be maintained by the 29 lots there. So it would be private ownership and maintained by those 29 lots, as well that the, the dock then is under private ownership. So it's not a public dock, it's a private dock in the sense that it's for the owners of this subdivision, which is appealing for, for a number of reasons. Um, so in the subdivision agreement that will be spelled out one way or the other how that's going to happen through through various negotiations and what have you <coughs> um, we certainly we heard here tonight one of the the um, uh, citizens was suggesting that we should maintain ownership of that um, that subdivision agreement is also brought forward to council for approval. So if that is something that council still wants to see in there or have a condo corp or whatever the case may be, it will be at that time that they will make the decision on, on that aspect. Uh, the other important reason for the subdivision agreement is uh, it requires final grading and drainage plans to be prepared. Uh, and not to, not just to my satisfaction or the township satisfaction, but also the conservation authority's satisfaction, so that they implement the conditions of the um, environmental impact assessment. And uh, that being said, there's also a condition in in there to include the uh, visual impact study recommendations in that subdivision agreement. Now, those things are, they were noted and they're, they are to be included in that subdivision agreement. And then that agreement is registered on title as well. So it's, it's, uh, <coughs> it's binding. The uh, issue with respect to the um, dark sky compliance. So dark sky compliance is a bit of a um, tricky one in the sense that it, it can't go backwards as it is right now um, and deal with the restaurants, uh, clubhouse lights um, that are existing or the dock lights that are existing now. Those are existing structures that are not like the building of that dock or, or reconstruction of that dock because the dock was there it, it was um refurbished or whatever you want to call it um through uh, permits from the conservation authority um those can those are not included however um as a goodwill gesture that i'm sure the developer would may consider something like that uh, to, to ease some of the concerns of, of the neighbors. 
the uh, the one comment that was made by I believe it was Mr. Comprini about the water quality. That was uh, in, in particular the the runoff and, and whatnot uh, for the lake. Um, the conditions of or conditions, the conclusions and recommendations, pardon me, of the hydro G study are to be included in the subdivision agreement. That's a draft plan condition that's set out there. And as well as the final grading and drainage to be approved by the conservation authority. Um, though there's also the removal of all of those cabins, which currently are so close to the lake that basically any septic system that is there is almost in the lake the way it is now. So the removal of those is probably going to be a, a, a big improvement in that sense. Uh, not to mention the septic systems from those are uh, quite uh, antiquated, shall we say. Um, the the uh, the other thing I'd like to point out is the with the uh, gold brown algae, I believe it was called, which is I guess another uh, concern regarding water quality. Um, one of the things that I, I'm probably going to bring forward in a separate report is whether or not council would like to look at um, instituting some sort of uh, septic inspection program for the lake itself for um, the new uh, subdivision as well as the existing homes on the lake because from what I understand now even prior to development um, the lake seems to be getting um, more uh, more phosphorus uh, in it and that would be uh, something that certainly would help with that is if we if we did implement something like that so I'm suggesting that I could bring forward another report to have council consider that issue um, the as far as the 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 grading and whatnot um, the first 30 meters from the the lake um, is is non-developable in terms of the uh, ability to put either septics in them or structures in them at all. Uh, so considering there's eight cottages within that distance now, um, the increased setback to 30 meters is, is pretty significant. Um, there's also recommendations in the EIS as far as putting in plantings and things like that that are better suited to absorbing nit nitrates and phosphorus and things like that uh, to, to, to help mitigate things like that, uh, if that is a concern. Uh, and this is in addition to the berming and, and all of that that will already be uh, taking, proposed to be taking place. So um, with all of that being said, um, there's also the groundwater flow, which the GM Blue Plan and our, our uh, engineers, Burnside, have agreed goes from east to west away from the lake. So once it's in the ground, it heads west. And that, that's a pretty significant I think in terms of impact, so uh, that that shouldn't be discounted. Uh, as far as the the reports from Burnside, where they they are, I'll call them municipal reports in the sense that they're commissioned by us as well as the County of Gray. So both of us together have been working with Burnside to address questions and concerns on the, the part of the township and by extension the taxpayers um, to address concerns regarding the lake and the impacts of this development on the lake. So uh, in, in conclusion, I, I do have a number of 
of conditions there that are, I believe it's attachment three to my report that uh, address all of the things that I just mentioned. The the one one thing I would point it is I mentioned at the beginning how there was a slight change in terms of the uh, dock block being an easement going into a, its own special block. Um, that needs to be included in condition two. Um, so that would be a minor change we would propose to make before it was sent to the county for further review and consideration is to include the dock block as part of uh, a condition that that the ownership of that be determined before any final approval is ever given and it be included in the subdivision agreement. So um, I'll leave it there. I'm not sure if I covered everything. I do know that uh, Genevieve from Cuesta Planning is also on the line for, for questions if I'm not able to answer it, but uh, I'll, I'll open it up for questions. Okay, uh, Dave has something and then uh, Michael and then Barb. You're on mute, Dave. No, you're still not you're, coming through. That's, that's not working, Dave. Is that better? Yep. Okay, yeah. sorry about that. Um, I want to provide some clarity around uh, the uh, stormwater ponds and the maintenance of those stormwater ponds. I think we have talked about uh, determining ownership of the ponds um, and and there has been discussions that they'd be retained by uh, possibly the, uh, the uh, homestead. Uh, and the reason for that is there's two types of maintenance, grass maintenance, which we don't want to do. If they want to maintain the, the vegetation in a certain state, that would be their prerogative. Uh, but what our easement would do is provide us access to those stormwater ponds to make sure the maintenance of the functioning of the stormwater pond is maintained, which means coming out with a high hole periodically and maybe cleaning out the sediment that's in the pond, but making sure that it functions as it's meant to function as a stormwater management pond. Okay, thank you. Michael? So I'm just kind of curious, um, we just mentioned that now, but is this going to be a gated community then if they're looking after the ponds or are we going to be the ones paying to get the sediments cleared out of those ponds? Um, Dave or? You want that clean or do you want me to? Okay, yeah. so uh, yeah, stormwater management ponds um, are retained the maintenance of them are retained by the townships or the the whatever the township the municipality and we need to make sure they function so it's like maintaining the roads maintaining storm water in town well this is maintaining storm water in a rural setting but what we're going to stay away from is cutting the grass around that pond because of distance to travel and so on and the size of the development but uh, we would maintain making sure that the function of the storm pond is that it's holding the water and releasing the water at the design rate it's meant to release the water into the uh, into surrounding streams. Okay, Michael? So just my follow-up is because Clint said that we were going to stay away from all of that, that that was going to be the uh, up to them to be managing that. That's what I was kind of curious about is how we go about managing that because I know it's a fair bit of money to clean this segment out of those ponds and when you got three of them there. And then the second thing is, is I'm not sure why we're in a rush to push this through quickly. Let's give these guys chance to uh, go through that Burnside's report and just make sure. I'm pretty sure that, uh, you know, this development will do everything they need to do, but let's not just push it, you know, let's give these time for, uh, you know, the homeowners in the area just to get all their questions answered. If they need, you know, another month, let's give them some time before we push this forward, just to make sure that you know, everybody, that there isn't something that's gonna come out of this. Um, I just think we should not push it, but I mean, let's do you want it. 
Do you want to speak to that, Clint, or do you want? Yeah. Sure. Clint. Okay, so um, as far as the Burnside report, again, the Burnside report is prepared for us and by extension, the taxpayers. So it, it, it's, it's what they would have to do if they, it, it's not meant to be peer reviewed a second time by, by the taxpayer in that sense. It's that, that's what the job of that report is. Uh, however, if, if people want to go in and look at it, um, certainly that they're able to do that. Um, I'm not sure what, what benefit there would be in, in terms of uh, delaying things another month. I, I don't see that being as a, uh, and not it necessary is not the right, as a, as a, I guess a, it, it wouldn't really achieve anything, but because yes, they're gonna have more time, but at the same time, they it's not us who make the decision, okay? So it's the County of Gray who makes the decision. The And this is just one report to advise the, the county on what we would like to see in that draft plan approval. So the engineers that we have hired have gone through all of that stuff and said, we think it's now fine for you to recommend approval of it. So that's where we're at. If ratepayers still have concerns, it, you can either wait, but I'm not, we're going to be arguing with our own peer reviewer if there's a concern about the peer review, or they can forward those comments on to the County of Gray and have the county um, uh, consider them. Uh, and, and add their own weight to it from that perspective. So that that's my thoughts on that. But uh, I think Dave has some stuff too. Yeah, and, and I just want to make sure council understands that this is um, draft plan conditions that come from uh, the studies and come from Clint as to what is necessary for this subdivision. And the, the feedback we got tonight was good. Uh, but that feedback will really uh, be more, and I'm saying from open forum, will be more for the zoning process. That's where it becomes a public process. But I think the, the draft plan conditions need to be put in place and we need to make sure they're refined. And then we go to the zoning process and have that discussion as to what are some challenges that the community wants addressed. And then we address those. But it's good to hear these, these things coming out tonight. But this is not a public process. The public process will come at the zoning where we can have that good public input and debate. And so we're really giving them a second chance, I think, to look at it a second time. Um, and uh, actually, the Burnside reports were put up for more of the zoning process than this process. Barb? Thank you. And thank you, Clinton, for addressing publicly uh, many of the questions that I forwarded to you in advance and actually elaborating on them a little further. I, I'm not sure if Randy Scherzer is on the call. He wasn't sure if he would make it and with, um, with, with the mayor's permission, he, he did give me permission to share his response to me with regard to a couple of things that uh, if, if it so pleases council, I can read. Um, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, are these things that he sent to uh, the Clinton so that they're in the record or are these? He did copy Clinton on the email, hmm. but I think it might be of help to address some of the concerns expressed by some of the individuals that sent us emails and also spoke at Open Forum. Okay. Um, but, but it's only with permission. Yep. Okay, so um, Randy replied that he can reach back out to the Min Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing in the one window approach to see if they have any further comments 
um, with regard to now that the ownership of the lake bottom has been confirmed as being the crown. As for any outstanding matters related to the subdivision, county staff will ensure that any outstanding matters have been addressed to our satisfaction prior to bringing forward a recommendation or a staff report to county council. For example, county will um, are still waiting for some updated studies from GM Blue Plan to reflect what has been discussed, agreed upon between GM Blue Plan and the peer reviewer, RJ Burnside. We also anticipate some further comments from SVCA following a meeting between SVCA and the e-consultant for the developer. We also need to finalize details regarding the ownership of the dock block. We also anticipate a slightly revised draft plan to incorporate some minor changes to the dock block and lot six. I think Clinton spoke to that. We also will need to do a full review of the file and comments received, including those from the public throughout in order to prepare the staff report and to make sure there are no further outstanding as it relates to the subdivision that can be addressed or can't be addressed through conditions of draft or draft approval. All of these matters are technical in nature. So that is from Randy Scherzer, um, the planning department at the county. Um, and I just wanted to ask maybe two things of Clinton. Uh, you spoke about you've you've addressed the cottages and uh, Randy's addressed the crown. Um, what live so we so one of my questions was about liability to the township with regard to septics and wells, and have we con, you know gotten a legal opinion? And I think that might it might be worthwhile to understand our role in the management and maintenance of the storm water ponds. Uh, not the grass around it, but the function of it and any liability through the approval process of um, 29 septics and 29 wells. Um, just, a, just a suggestion. And there were um, some outstanding items and I don't remember the number of the, of the concern about Camp Creek in the peer review, but there was still some um, expression that we that there should it should be looked at and as a cold water trout waterway and uh, the flow of of groundwater into Camp Creek. I'm not an engineer or an environmentalist to understand it completely, but I know that that was something, and I'm and I'm pretty sure that that will get addressed. Um, because it's been raised by Burnside. Um, and I think other than the, the lighting, I think you've answered all of my questions um, either tonight or through an email. So I thank you very much. And I thank council for allowing me to read Randy's reply. Okay, thank you. Any more uh, comments or questions, Martin? Thanks, John. Yeah, hi, Clinton. Uh, the one comment from, uh, well, one of the people speak tonight was the, uh, it, it said it was proposed to be waived the lake carrying capacity study. Is that going to happen? Are you, is, is that really important? Because when I look at it, they said they were allowed 17 on the lake, there's 15 now. And with all these additional frontage lots to the lake, that'll put it up to about, well, 24 or 25, I think. So is that going to be looked at? And also the other chap, I think it was Mr. Caprini talking about the phosphorus, which is not septic. It's it's all these people going to be putting uh, their fertilizer or getting the weed man in. Are, are those reports that could be looked at before we send it off? Because along with the Camp Creek, because I would think they're fairly important. Um, you know, a personal thing, the one, the one from Mr. Caprini said, Wilder Lake has an existing algae problem. I've seen a lot of these, personally, I've seen a lot of these lakes up north and I've been back five years later and a third of it becomes bog because 
there's always been vegetation every year dying off, making food for these blooms of algae. So what came first, the development or the fact this lake has a natural life where in 100 years it could be a bog where nobody wanted to live there? With that being said, uh, would, those, would those reports be needed or have they already been done or what? And, and as far as like, and one more, if I may, I realize that might have been two. They were kind of the same. Uh, as far as liability, I know the ones, the ones up in Hanover, I think the municipality has to check their water all the time because of the blue, blue algae that they get. Same kind of lake. Uh, I, would, I wouldn't want to really have the township years down the road have any problems like that. So um, I think the forest, phosphorus, uh, there should be a report done on that. Just, just mm -hmm. comments. Okay, Clint. Okay, so um, the county, the county of Gray, and the township together met with the developer initially when they first came came about with this proposal and outlined a number of the studies that were required. And the the way it was worded to the developer was that you have to demonstrate that you're not going to impact the lake. Okay, so if you do a lake carrying capacity study, fine, or demonstrate that you're not going to impact the lake. And that's the route that they've taken based on providing uh, grading and drainage, doing uh, environmental impact assessment, doing a visual impact assessment, doing um, the hydro G work to, to look at how the, the water is being graded. Um, all of this is going to be included in the site plan, uh, or sorry, not site plan, subdivision agreement, um, which will bind all of that together mm -hmm. and make sure it's all implemented. So that's the route that they chose to go to so that there's not going to be an impact on the lake. Okay. Um, with respect to the wells, uh, these are individual wells and, and privately owned wells and septics, and therefore the responsibility falls with each individual property owner with respect to maintaining and caring for those wells and septics and, and, and so forth. Okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not sure. There is, did I get them all? <laughs> or did I miss one? Yeah, uh, just to follow. No, I, I can see that yeah. because I, I have all I have everything on my computer from the last time they came up, and I know mm -hmm. they did a great job on on getting the buffers. As long as that I can see the buffer right now that I'm looking at, mm -hmm. and and to actually have plants planted that are really high in absorbing nitrates, but. Um, uh, number six of Mr. Caprini's uh, email, it's not anything to do with the wells or it's the actual water runoff from the grass. So, and, and, and I, I have another question for Jim if he's still in there too, so, but okay, so just wondering. I, again, that runoff, we, there, there's a number of things they're proposing to do. One is, is is grading and drainage, providing sort of like a berm along that edge um, to, to stop that runoff to, to some extent. Um, uh, plantings along, along that area to absorb any um, additional nitrates, et cetera, as well as having a 30 meter buffer, that's 100 feet um, from, yeah. from the boundary um, which is a heck of a lot more than what's there now. Um, it, it, it'll actually be outside of all of that um, tree vegetation that you actually see there. So, mm -hmm. and, and there are um, things like uh, restrictive covenants and things that you can put in zoning to ensure that those lands are, are not um, disturbed, if you will. So you can, 
Um, it put make sure that they're in like an environmental protection zone so that you can't place structures in that 30 meter buffer um, yeah. of any kind. Um, you could put a restrictive covenant on there if you wanted to make sure that there's no um, pesticides or 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 whatnot put on there. So th these are some things that we're we're looking at including as well in the subdivision agreement to to enhance the protection for the lake. Yeah. Okay. No, I I kind of figured that. So that's good. Um, and, and just can I make one more point? Sure. sure. Um, the fact that the, these lots, and, and this is what some of the engineers have, have mentioned to us in, in, in discussions, is the fact that these are lots and they're, they're changing a golf course use to residential lots. The amount of fertilizers required on a golf course is a, a lot more than, than these few lots that are along the frontage. So the fact that it's going I'll say down from a, a a golf course use is actually a good thing for the lake because a golf course is one of the worst things because of how manicured they have to keep the greens and the fairways and, and all of that sort of thing. Oh yeah, I, I totally agree with that, uh, Clinton. I always I always smile when people say they want to go golfing and be part of nature while you're just being part of a big manicured lawn. You've got nothing to do with nature. So I totally agree with that. I never thought of that. So I thank you for that. Um, through the chair, can I have one question to, uh, if I may, if I'm allowed, to Jim, if he's still on? He's there. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Jim, on this, uh, the idea of doing septic uh, studies, didn't we, uh, didn't we have one 15 years ago when I actually think you were on my property checking my system out? You did a township-wide check a while ago. Uh, would 15 years be the time to do it again? Go ahead. Especially uh, now, especially now with this, or would they still be okay? I wasn't involved with that. Uh, that was the building department uh, back then. It was Mr. Cop, and uh, we were hired on. Uh, Mr. Main Prize to, to come in and do that function. So uh, oh. I, I, Bev may know more about that, but uh, it, it wasn't me and uh, it, it was okay. about that time frame probably. Okay, thank you. Yep, and that, that's really kind of outside of this, this agreement. Well, yeah, that's true, um, but well, yeah. isn't it? But, but good point. Well, thank, you, thank, you, thank you anyway, John, I appreciate that. Yeah, no problems. Uh, Dave. Yeah, I just wanted to build on uh, something Clint had said about, uh, you know, the the water around the uh, the groundwater and so on, and the management of that. What uh, we have uh, had discussions with the developer is, is they um, there's a time which they would pull the monitoring wells on the property out after the studies are done, and we've had discussions and asked them to maintain those uh, wells for the life of the project, so that they can monitor you know, the, the phase one of the development and where the water, if the, is there changes to the water? Is it better, is it worse? So we can get those kind of reports over the life and the phasing of the projects, which I think is important. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Barbara? Uh, Jason here, John, oh, or go ahead. Jason? No, let Jason, you go first, you haven't spoken yet. Well, that's fine, no. I, I'm a little, uh, I'm not sure of my understanding this, so, the county is the one that makes the final decision on this subdivision. Did I, did I hear that right? Is that, I don't know, that's yep. the Dave or, yeah. Yeah. So why are we spending so much staff time? I, I understand it's it's on our, on our, uh, in our area, but it seems like we're spending a lot of staff time, reports this, report that, for what a decision that the county is going to make. I'm just wondering why, uh, like, I understand there's all this stuff to go through, but it just seems like and it, and then the county people are going to do the same thing. It seems to me. Just, just wondering. Yep, Clint's going to explain. Um, I, the, it, it's similar to why you have a, a local planner versus a, a county planner. Is the county's not going to have any appreciation for the workings or the uh, 
the constraints of, of the and preferences for that matter of the local township. So as an example that the the stormwater management ponds, whether or not we want to own them or not, that's that's something that's a township preference as opposed to a county decision. When it comes to things like sidewalks, do we want them? Do we want them on both sides? It's all it's all looked after and managed by us. And it's in our community and therefore we're the ones who ha should have the biggest say in terms of how the development proceeds um, as opposed to the the top down from the county just saying this is how it's going to be and uh, so that's why our, the draft plan conditions are important in the sense that it looks after all the things that we want to have looked after and then they can deal with some of the other conditions um, as well we, we still have the zoning, which is another implementation tool for this, um, in, in addition to that. So um, that's sort of why we, we have it this way. Um, they haven't delegated that powers to us. Certainly, um, we could make petition for that to happen at some level if we wanted to. I know, uh, I think Blue Mountains is in the process of trying to do that, and the city of Old Sound already has that those delegated powers. So it depends on how big or small you are, but certainly um, first and foremost is looking out for the township interests. Okay. All right, Jason. Yeah, no, I just had one follow up too. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, as far as uh, as far as us um, maintaining those ponds, yeah, I, I don't think it's, if it's on private property, I, I don't see why we would. Uh, that's just my opinion. Um, do we maintain a lot of other ones in some situation like that? Dave, you wanna? Yes, uh, yes we do. We maintain all stormwater management ponds that are uh, um, in subdivisions or in a municipality. Um, it's just that we need to make sure that they uh, function as a storm facility, just like we, you know, uh, manage catch basins in Swinton Park or on our roads or in Dundalk that catch uh, silt and so on. We need to uh, manage that silt uh, ret uh, retention and clean it up and make sure it functions as it's designed to. The bigger cost really is going out on a whatever three times a month or two times a month uh, to cut the grass around these darn things. Um, that's the bigger expense to go out with a high hoe, you know, we want every two or three or five years, depending how, how it functions. Um, you know, we maybe inspect it once a year and maintain it uh, to remove silt three, you know, three or four times in, in 10 years, maybe. Okay. Okay. Any other, Barb? Thank you, Mayor Woodbury. Uh, just a couple of things that cropped up from the discussion and the questions from various people. Um, the comment about golf courses, and I understand, you know, the grooming of golf courses and the use of pesticides and fertilizers. And I, and I just wondered if um, a golf course adjacent to a lake, if those standards are different than a regular golf course, and it may be worthwhile in determining what um, are there current practices as far as, you know, the, you know, is it going to be of benefit? But that leads me into my other comment. Clinton, you mentioned in your email about the remaining uh, lot that's going to remain a golf course and that it's not part of a plan of subdivision. So it would remain a golf course or green space. Is that correct? Did I, did I interpret that answer correctly? Yes, it will remain part of the, like, as a golf course or, or that use is proposed to continue as it is now. Mm -hmm. And it's not currently part of the plan of subdivision uh, that was part of the OP previously. Settlement yeah, areas. It, so, I used the wrong term, settlement area. Yeah. <laughs> so there's, there's, a golf course is a big area. Uh, yes. Certainly some of the, the holes are outside of that settlement area um, designation in the official plan. 
and are are proposed to stay in that area. Um, the only area that's actually within that re that's going to stay that way is the the restaurant clubhouse um, lot that's on the on the property, which is sort of a retained lot, if you will, okay. uh, in the subdivision. And if I may then also, with the public access to the lake, with the addition of 29 homes and the potential for some of those 29 homes to have sea and motorized boats, and um, we've already experienced some complaints from lake residents about people coming on the lake or visitors to the lake. Um, whose responsibility would it be to deem that lake and any public access or access by lake residents to be a non-motorized use, like electric motors or canoes and kayaks? Just before we get to that, is that is that part of what this um, meeting is about this? Maybe not. This, this report? I think it's something worth looking at, but I, I don't think it's actually I'm just asking Clint if that's not Good within point. the realm of what can be handled with this report. I can take that offline, Mayor Woodbury. And I just want to add that there's that through this process, if there are still concerns that need to be expressed either by council or if we have questions with regard to the studies that were um, put on the website in the last 48 hours ourselves or members of the public, it would now then uh, be our responsibility to share those concerns with the county. Is that correct, Clinton? Uh, if this goes through and... Yeah, it, it certainly was still with, with the township as well as the county because just because we send these conditions off to them doesn't mean like that's the day the decision is made. If there's some massaging that needs to happen with wording or or there needs to be an additional uh, condition included that um, addresses a particular concern or something, um, the discussion is still open for okay. that. It, it, it doesn't close until Randy says, okay, I'm bringing a report to, to council, to county council. Thanks. And even then, it only finishes once that county council makes the decision. Okay, so keep you and Randy Scherzer um, on, your, on their speed dial. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, we've got... Thank uh, you, no, no problem. We've had a good long discussion on this. Uh, so I think it's uh, it's time for the vote. And uh, so this is another step in several steps that uh, for refining it. So I'll call the question. Is anyone opposed to the motion? Okay, hearing none, I'll uh, declare that passed. And we will move on to, uh, there's no bylaws and uh, motions. Uh, any notice of motion? Okay, hearing none. Uh, welcome back, Brian. We just did the notice of motions. Uh, I don't know if you have any. Don't look like you do right now. Okay. Um, I know which motion you're waiting for. <clears throat> uh, consent items. The regular consent moved by Michael and seconded by Brian. Does uh, anyone, I didn't get anyone uh, pulling any of those things. So I'll just ask now if anyone wants to pull any. And if not, does anyone want to comment on any of the regular consent items? 10.1, Barbara? I just had a couple. Um, each 10.1.1, welcome to Charlie Hodges. Kayla, yep. I, um, you know, it's unfortunate that we're participating by Zoom and, and I don't know if Charlie is online or <laughs> participating in the background, but uh, it'd be nice to get to meet her or him uh, face to face through Zoom or go meetings and um, just to um, to welcome her or him. Not sure. 
can comment on that quickly. Sure, <laughs> uh, So it is her. And yes, once she starts, then we would invite her into one of the council meetings so that everyone can see her face. It is a little more awkward right now, but sure. uh, she will also be in the office too if people do tend to pop in here and there to grab things from the vestibule. So we'll make sure that we do our introductions. Okay, that's great. great. And Mr. Uh, sorry, Mayor Woodbury, 10.1.3 uh, to Jim Ellis, the Egremont Landfill Monitoring Report. Uh, it indicates that there is migration of leachate impacted groundwater to the east and that measures should be taken to mitigate impacts. Um, what are your thoughts or will there be um, an additional report or um, are we already doing something? Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, um, I've already uh, had some discussions with GM Blue Plan on some uh, measures we can take and uh, also the development of the, the new cell. Um, so we had a meeting uh, that was scheduled, but due to uh, our health unit situation here, it was canceled. So we are working on it. Stay tuned. Uh, we do have some uh, measures to, to help with this. Great. And just one follow up. Yep. Jim, I ask this every time this report comes up and you did mention it in the report that um, about the MEC amendment, MECP amendment. And it's been three years. Would it be worth a letter from the mayor, council, um, the CAO, just asking have they lost it? Is it buried? I know there's been other priorities, but three years, are they, are we going to get an answer soon? Go ahead, Jim. The last month uh, here, we've uh, had uh, information from them and uh, some questions they've asked. We're returning those questions. Um, I've been working on a compost plan. I know it's one of uh, their uh, pieces to the amendment they're going to be requiring. So uh, they have come forward and we're getting close. Uh, we're working on the final uh, stages here. So should be shortly. Well, that's great news that they're in contact with us now. So thank you very much, Jim. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, anyone else have anything on 10.1 items? Okay, Martin. Yeah, I'll just piggyback on uh, ten one three with the Agrimont. Just a, it just kind of popped in my head. It says we'll provide for greater than a hundred years of additional site life with all the work that's going on. Uh, this could be for Jim or Dave. Would that be uh, a part of the assessment, our assessment uh, paperwork we're doing? Because it is certainly an asset for the next few years to come. Would that be part of the asset management plan? Or is? So, I, would, I would say yes, but I don't know if you, one of you guys want to answer that. Yeah, you want to take that one? Yeah. yeah. Currently, facilities aren't in the asset management plan. They will be added here shortly. Um, definitely, it's okay. an asset, but it is not uh, one of the focused areas at this point. Okay, thanks. Okay. okay, so if there's no more uh, questions on 10.1, uh, is anyone opposed to the motion? Okay, that's carried. 10.2 is the correspondence consent agenda, moved by Barbara, seconded by Martin. And again, I don't have anything uh, pulled there, but uh, does anyone want to comment on any of that? Okay, uh, call the motion. Uh, is anyone opposed to that mo the motion to receive that? That is passed. 10.3, resolutions from other municipalities, moved by Brian, seconded by Jason. Uh, any comments or questions on any of that stuff? Okay. Is anyone opposed to the motion? That is carried. 
We have no closed session consent information. Uh, uh, county report. It's been so long that I can't think of what we did last time. <laughs> um, I can't, uh, nothing comes to mind of what was going on. Brian, do you have any thoughts? I, I, think, you, I think you captured it all in your comments. Yeah, it's been pretty sparse lately with uh, with some of the things. So if you have any questions about that, you can contact Brian. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we actually are meetings tomorrow, so uh, we'll uh, we'll get you the next. Yeah, time maybe maybe work, ask that so. question to me about one o'clock tomorrow. I'll be able to give you a better answer. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Okay, so then now I've lost the whole agenda. There we are. Um, members privilege. Does anybody have anything for that? Okay, um, and we don't have anything for closed meeting. One of the things I will mention just under me members privilege is I think it's really important for everybody to uh, support all of our uh, various volunteer organizations, as well as all our businesses. Just in this time, I think they need our support more than uh, more than ever. And uh, that's what uh, the community is all about. Uh, next, we have a uh, motion moved by Jim, seconded by Barbara, and it's the confirming bylaw. Any questions or comments on that? Okay, Lindsay, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mayor Woodbury. Recorded vote for the confirming bylaw. Councillor Rice? Yes. Councillor Tipston? Yes. Mayor Woodbury? Yes. Councillor Shearson? Yes. Deputy Mayor? Uh, yay. Councillor Dobreen? In favor. Councillor Frew? Yes. I vote a seven to zero, that's carried. Great. Uh, we have one more motion moved by Brian that we adjourn. Uh, does anyone want a recorded vote on this? <laughs> Thanks everybody. Uh, covered a lot of ground tonight and uh, and water and uh, <laughs> appreciate all the work. So thanks Thank you, very everyone. much. Yep. Thank you. Night, Thank everyone. you everyone. Thanks. See you. Stay safe, yep. everybody. Okay.